we're about to find out. Let's, I'd like to pray one more time if that's okay. Father, we just continue in the spirit of worship. We continue to ask that you would speak. We dedicate this time. We dedicate our hearts. May this be a sacred moment where you come in and change us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God is good. And he's coming soon. Yeah, it sounds like you kind of believe it. His grace is sufficient. Three of you agree with that. His love is everlasting. Do you believe those things? Then speak up, please. It's always a bit of an intimidating thing to speak up. I mean, to insert ourselves into a moment. Most of us have some inhibitions about doing that. And we're kind of worried about those who don't have inhibitions, who have no problem speaking up. Sometimes we wish they would just pipe down a little bit. Uh, and so we, we seek to find the balance in that. And we want to make sure that the Lord is leading us when we find opportunity to speak up. My message to you today is very simple. It's very simple. And it's simply this. It is time for God's church and God's people to speak up. It's not a time to be silent. And I don't mean this in a preachy, coercive, pressuring kind of way. We sometimes think about those who are overly ambitious about sharing their faith. I'm talking about weaving and including the language of faith in our everyday life as it is as natural to us as anything else we talk about. This is something I think that we are missing and losing as a community, and that's how um, I want to address today with you uh, in the message and pray that God uh, reveals his message to you. Now, when the kids uh, have children's church, I kind of switch the idea from a kid's quiz to a teen trivia, so I ask the young people, any of you, uh, the kids, you don't have to be a teen, but just indulge uh, me if you would and help us work through this little uh, beginning to the message to get us in the flow of things. I didn't ask anyone to grab mics. Could I have a couple people grab mics for me? Anyone be willing? Usually Toby uh, is here and someone else, but we want to make sure uh, people can hear. Thank you, John. Thank you, George. I try not to make these too complicated. I know for a lot of you guys coming through school, you have trivias and quizzes and stuff all the time, and, and I don't want you to have bad thoughts about it. But let's just get into the message by looking at some quick questions. You, you should know this one. At a burning bush, he said, I am slow of speech and slow of tongue, yet he became a man of power in words and deeds. Who are we talking about here? But raise your hand, please. Young people especially. Any of our young people, help us out. Not meant to fool you. Is that a burning bush? <laughs> uh, wait, who are we talking about? Yeah, that's the question. Do you remember who's at the burning bush? Uh, uh, Moses. Moses. How many of you agree with him? Okay. Where's the Bible teachers here? Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about Moses. Moses, who at the beginning of his ministry and calling said, "I don't ask me to speak up. I, I." I get tongue-tied. I'm slow. It just doesn't work. But by the end of his ministry, he is a man powerful in words and deed, according to the book of Acts. All right. Number two, which prophet's lips were touched with a coal from the altar? Which prophet's lips were touched? Do you remember this story? He says, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple, and the thresholds of the temple shook when the seraphim cried out, Holy, holy, holy. And he said, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Ringing a bell? Which prophet are we talking about here? Young people? Madden? <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. No, no, not me. All right, come on. Jeremiah? That's a very good guess, but it's wrong. <laughs> All right. Ray. Ray's going to help us out. 
Isaiah. Isaiah is the one we're talking about. Isaiah who says, look, uh, I don't have the right ability to do work for you. But then the Lord cried out, who will go for us? And whom shall I send? And after his lips had been touched with the cold. Now, this is in vision, by the way, in vision. But after his lips had been touched, he says, here am I, send me. And Isaiah becomes one of the great prophets of the Bible. All right, number three. Which prophet said the word of the Lord is like a burning fire shut up in my bones? Now, any of you who grew up Pentecostal, you would know this one. Who said that? Who said the word of the Lord? There's a song that goes with this. Gio, you know this song? It's like a fire shut up in my bones, that Holy Ghost fire. No one's singing with me. Shut up in my bones. I've got that fire. I guess I'm the only one. Shut up in my bones. Who are we talking about here? Okay, I know most of our young people are over here, but we have some young ones. It's okay to guess. It's all right. Come on, guys. Another prophet here. There's only so many of them. Titus? No? Marshall? Ezekiel? You're actually a prophet, Ezekiel? <laughs> Something. Somebody? All right. The teens have kind of gone into shell shock here. Anyone want to hazard a guess? Raise your hand. I hear you whispering. You're whispering. Was that Mr. Owens? It wasn't you. Okay, he said it. Didn't get into the recording, but Ben will. Jeremiah. Make it. Jeremiah is the answer. He said, "When God gave me a word, I couldn't keep it in. It was like a fire in my bones, and uh, I cannot be silent." Now, just notice this little uh, thing. There's just two more, John and, and George. Two more. Just notice the three, a burning bush, a burning coal, and burning bones, all led to powerful ministry. You see this kind of uh, theme, this motif going, and it's not just here, it's throughout other places. In the New Testament, on the day of Pentecost, what appeared above the disciples' heads? You remember this story? We need the pathfinders here, because they've got Bible Bowl and stuff like that. They would, uh, okay, Danica is going to help us out. Thank you. <laughs> Or was that coach forcing Danica? Fire? She's, she's asking John. What did you say? Fire? Fire! Oh, my goodness. You are right. Oh, boy, we need to get back to Sabbath school. I say, uh, <laughs> on the day of Pentecost, they see fire. And you, you have this motif and this theme of the fire of the Spirit, the fire of the Lord. We'll talk about that. So after this happened, when the fire the tongues of fire appear above the heads. What happens on the day of Pentecost? They had potluck, and they sang around in songs, and they all went home. Is that what happened? Okay, a uh, uh, young lady here in the middle. I think her name's Betty, John. I don't know her. Could you, uh, she's going to help us out here. They preached the word of God. They did. It's, it's known as the end gathering. George, John, thank you for, for helping move the mics around. Oops, I went one too far. They are filled with the Spirit, the Bible says. They speak in tongues, okay, in languages others could recognize. Uh, we'll look at that a little bit. Peter preaches a powerful sermon, and at the end of that sermon, people say, we want this. We want to commit our life to this. We want to know more about this, and we want to be dedicated and 3,000 people were baptized because of this experience. We're familiar with the, the fundamentals. If you've been in the church at all, if you've been experienced uh, in, in reading your Bibles, the whole purpose of our church, the whole purpose of our movement, we call it the Great Commission. It's found in different ways in different Gospels. The one we're most familiar with probably is Matthew's uh, version because it's the first of the Gospels. It's right at the end of his book. When Jesus is about to depart to heaven, he says, go therefore, this is the Lord Jesus speaking, go therefore, and he says, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's called the Great Commission. It's the mission of the church. It's why we exist both as a community and as an individual. We individually and we as a community are invited to be a part of that. Mark it puts it slightly different. Jesus, again, speaking at the end of Mark's gospel, he says, go into all the world and Preach the gospel to all creation. Uh, and, and so Matthew says, make disciples. Mark says, 
preach the gospel. Now, Luke has a version of the Great Commission. You'll find it in the first chapter of Acts when Jesus is, again, he's, a, he's risen from the dead. He's, he's talking with his disciples. He's explaining what they, they need to be looking for and doing. And he says it, uh, he says it this way in Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has a, uh, come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. So no matter which one you look at, they all carry this similar idea of who we are as a people, what our mission is, is to make disciples, to preach the gospel, be my witnesses. It's similar ways of saying the same thing. But to, to, to sum it up in just one way, I would put it this way. Speak up. The work of Jesus Christ in your heart is not something to be kept to yourself. Now, I, I want to acknowledge and, and recognize that there is a great importance, importance to be balanced in this. Uh, we, of course, we want to let our actions speak louder than our words, right? We want to have the quiet conduct of, of, of the transformed life operating in our lives as well. We want to be evangeliving as much as we are evangelizing, right? And we realize that we shouldn't be telling other people to live like Christ if we live like the devil, right? That's counter to what the gospel is. People will say, if that's what the gospel is, I don't want any part of it. You tell me to live holy and then you steal. You tell me to live holy and then I see uh, all the things that you do and you're not dedicated to the very things. So yes, we need to be balanced. We need to uh, allow our lifestyle and, and, and how we have moral influence to have a role, but that is no excuse to say, therefore, I have no obligation to actually speak about the things that God has done in my life and invite others or give others opportunity to hear about the faith that I have dedicated myself to. Speak up, please. Now, I want to come to the story in Acts chapter 2 uh, as an illustration. And we're going to spend a few moments in this passage uh, in a couple of places here as we move through the message today. And again, for most of you, you're at least somewhat familiar with this, aren't you? Come on, the day of Pentecost, is this brand new to you? Okay, this is the birthplace of the church, right? This is the moment when the disciples of Christ, the followers of Christ, transition from a focus on the Son of God being the man walking with them on earth to them being filled with the Holy Spirit with passion and carrying forward the mission of the church and birthing into the world the movement that we now call the church. So it's pretty pivotal, pretty foundational to who we are as a people if you've dedicated your life to Christ. So in just in short, they gather together. So let's just read it. I'll just read it. When the day of Pentecost have come, has come, they were all together in one place. A small group, about 100, 120 of them. Acts chapter 1 actually enumerates them when they were meeting for prayer in Acts chapter 1. It says there were 120 of them. They all gathered together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them as tongues of fire distributing themselves, and they rested only on Peter. Did you see that? Only Peter had the tongue of fire on his head. Is that what your Bible says? How many of them had the fire? It happened to all of them. It wasn't just to the figureheads. It wasn't just to the leaders. It wasn't just to the original, well, the remaining 11 uh, disciples. Every single one in that prayer meeting heard the wind and had the fire come upon them. And how many of them were filled with the Holy Spirit? Speak up, please. <laughs> All of them. How many of us are called to be filled with the Spirit and to open up our mouths and speak about the faith that God has blessed us with. All were filled with the Holy Spirit, and all began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Very important moment. Uh, and again, just to recap the story, uh, people hear them. Now, they're not preaching sermons when this happens. They're just filled with the Spirit and they begin to open up their mouths and begin to speak in other languages. And we know they're other languages because 16 nations are listed after this saying, hey, we hear them speaking our tongue. Okay, 16 different people groups are mentioned after this. All right. So they began to speak in languages they previously had not been able to understand. But what were they saying? 
It tells us a few verses later in Acts chapter 2. They say, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. That's what they were saying. They were praising God. They were, they were sharing about the good things that they could see God had done in their lives and that God was preparing to do for them moving forward. And when they were filled with the Spirit, even if they were in their own setting, they weren't street corner preachers. They weren't, uh, again, going around thumping people on the head with their Bibles. They just had the Spirit of God moving in their lives and it naturally led them to speak up. And people heard it. And people were blessed. And then Peter gets up as the leader, shares the powerful message, and people's lives are eternally changed in this moment because the church spoke up. I like this parallel with Psalm 126. We were like those who dream. Our mouth was filled with laughter. Our tongue with joyful shouting. And then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Yes, the Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Now, Peter will say what you've seen happen here at the, on the day of Pentecost is a fulfillment of Joel, but I believe it was also a fulfillment of Psalm 126. They were as though they were in a dream. This is one of the Psalm of Ascents as they come out of the captivity, and they say, we were so excited about what God has done for us, it was like we were in a dream, and laughter and joy filled our mouths. So much that the nations heard it. And said, who is this God who has done great things for you? The Lord has done great things for us. I was probably about 13 years old when I preached my very first sermon. And it wasn't in the safe confines of a, a, an academy campus or a church or even a church camp. It was right here at Riverfront Park at the Clock Tower Meadow in downtown Spokane. When I was a teenager, the Bible camp that I went to was not an Adventist. The Bible camp I went to was just a few miles from Spokane. And uh, about the year I was 13 or so, if I remember right, uh, during camp they made an announcement. We're going to go, we're going to do a strike team into Spokane. We're going to go, uh, we're going to go preach in Spokane. Uh, does, do, do anyone want to come with us? We're going to pass out literature and we're going to invite everyone to the Clock Tower Meadow and, and we need someone to preach. I don't remember volunteering. I don't remember volunteering to say, pick me, pick me. But I do remember agreeing um, to speak. Um, and so this is kind of the very first time I ever kind of stood in front of a group of people and kind of shared from my heart a, a perspective on, on the things of God. And the, the topic that I chose, um, again, as a public school student, uh, I was always confronted with the issue of evolution. And I was fairly, fairly well versed, fairly well confident that I could share some spiritual principles about the debate between creation and evolution. So that was my topic. So we go to Spokane and we go around the park and we hand out literature and we invite people to come to the clock tower because we're going to share some message. And they've got this all cleared through the city fathers and all that to, to be allowed there at Riverfront Park. This is kind of like the downtown kind of, you know, main park uh, there in the town of Spokane. And right there, Right there is where I stood. Now, it's actually kind of sloped. The picture doesn't show it as much, but it's kind of a natural amphitheater that slopes right towards the, the, uh, the concrete steps there. And I go up, and I, for the very first time, as scared as can be, I thought I was going to pee my pants, I, t I tell you, as nervous as can be, I stood up there, no microphone, no amplification system, that wasn't allowed, and uh, there were some preliminary comments by some of the staff and counselors and others that were there. But they said, but we have a student, we have a young man. He wants to share to you uh, about uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's all listen to him. And I go up there on those uh, steps and I stand there and I look out and there's not a big crowd, not a big crowd. I would say, again, as memory serves, 70 to 80 people, maybe kind of scattered out on the lawn. Uh, and what I remember about that day, it was very windy, very windy. And, um, you know, I have a, a decent voice. I can project if I want. But, you know, when the wind is blowing, it feels like just no matter what you say, it just evaporates into the wind. And that added to my nervousness as well. But anyways, so I'm beginning to talk, and, I, and I'm saying, you know, I know a lot of people believe in evolution or whatever, but I used an illustration that others had used with me before. I, I, I brought a soda can, and it was an empty soda can, and I just held it up. And I said, you know what, how many of you just walking along the beach or walking along the forest, if you found a soda can, would you go, oh, wow, what a marvelous 
a, a, a thing of evolution. Wind and erosion and rain and, and earthquakes have created this soda can that says Pepsi on it and has all the nutritional information on it. Isn't evolution powerful for creating this soda can? You, you get the analogy, right? You know, uh, and, and, and so I just talked about how, how silly that would be, that, that no one would ever see a soda can and say that was evolution. That was just a natural, just the moving of tectonic plates and the striking of lightning and the, the waves and the tides and everything could possibly create a soda can. But if, 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 if nature can't produce a soda can, how much more complex is a living being, right? So I'm making the whole argument, and people are just, they're wowed. They're, they are just wowed. They're just swept off their, no. I have no, I, I'm not looking at anybody. I'm just kind of doing my thing. But what I remember about this very first sermon it was probably a total of 10 minutes. And no one said amen. Thank you. We're going to go another 30 now. Um, is as I am trying to make this analogy about, you know, soda cans don't evolve, and if they don't evolve, then, you know, neither do we. A great big gust of wind blew from, from this side to that side. That would be uh, going east, okay? Great big gust of wind blows by. And as I'm holding this can... On the, the stone pavers and concrete, uh, a random empty uh, aluminum soda can starts rolling across, going tink, 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 right across there. And I, I held up that soda can, and I said, look, everyone, evolution in action. And everyone started laughing, and it was kind of the, you know, the, the, the end of it. See, that's silly. Not only did, did the can not evolve, neither did you. A loving God created you. Let's pray. Something like that. 13 years old. I wasn't a preacher when I was 13. Well, I talked to my mom. Maybe she would call me a preacher. I was just a kid, but the opportunity came, and uh, I was willing to do it. And that's my first memory of a public address of giving a message about God. Now, I just want you to contemplate this for a moment. Do you really think it's possible that it's God's will for you to live your entire life without ever specifically telling another soul about Jesus Christ? Is that possible? Oh, Pastor, that's your job. That is Dave Lounsbury's job. That's Dwight Nelson's job. John Bradshaw can do that. Maybe Mark Finley can do that. Notice the order I put those in. Dave Lounsbury first. Cut for you, Kai. How many of them were filled with the Spirit, friends? They were all filled with the Spirit. Do you really think it's possible that you as a redeemed, regenerated believer in Jesus Christ should never have specific opportunity to tell another soul have you ever met my friend Jesus? You want to know why I don't have worry about the next election? It's because I worship Jesus. And I believe he's coming soon. I believe there's a God that loves me and he's changed my heart. Have you ever said that? When was the last time you told someone, I'm a Christian? When was the last time? I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Um, I used to work at Costco. Uh, and uh, w uh, right after I got married, I got married while I was working at Costco, just come back from my honeymoon, uh, I meet a new worker at Costco. His name's Rusty. He's still a good friend of ours. Um, and uh, didn't know him at all, though, when I meet him. And, but he and I, you know, when you first meet someone, you can kind of figure out whether or not you're going to get along with them fairly quick. You know, do you have things in common? Do you not have things in common? I had just gotten married. He was just engaged to get married. We we're both working at Costco, and we start talking a little bit. Um, and, and we're starting to say, hey, we kind of get along, you know, maybe we can hang out a little bit. But one day we're at Costco both pushing carts. Have you ever seen people out pushing carts at Costco? By the way, I did it back in the day when they didn't have the little motorized thing that pushes them. Okay, I just push the carts and hope that the one at the end doesn't fly off and hit a car somewhere. We're out pushing carts. And we're, we're talking, and I happened to mention to Rusty, I was just getting into golf. There were a lot of golfers at Costco at the time, and we... Uh, from time to time, we go out and play golf. And I'd say, you know, I'm kind of into golf, Rusty. What do you think? He's like, I really am into golf too. That's fun. Let's go golfing sometime. I said, yes, let's go. When can we go golfing? And I'll never forget my buddy, Rusty. Didn't know him at all. 
We'd known each other maybe a few weeks. I knew he was engaged. I knew he worked at Costco and I knew he, and I knew he liked golf. But he turned to me as we're trying to figure out a time to golf. And he says, well, I just need to let you know something. I'm a Christian. And I go to church every Sunday. So if we're going to go golfing, just let's not go on a Sunday morning because that's not available to me. I go to church. Oh, I get goosebumps even when I remember that. When was the last time you said that to someone? I will never, you know, and of course, me being a Christian as well, I was like, oh, that's great. Another thing we have in common, I go to church too. But of course, I'm holier than you. I'm Pentecostal. He was some kind of thing called a Nazarene. Who cares about the Nazarenes? Pentecostals, they're going to be first in line in heaven. Right after Adventists. No, of course, we had a, we had a wonderful kind of, you know, repertoire over that. And, and, uh, um, but, but I'll just, I remember the boldness of him. He, I could have been an atheist. He didn't know me. I could have been someone hurt by Christianity or someone that, you know, was a, a spiritualist or something. I could have said, what an idiot you are. I thought we were going to be friends, but no, not anymore. You're this weird uh, Christian person who, he didn't know what I was going to say. But I was impressed at his clarity and his boldness of saying, as, as we get to know each other, it's important for you to know. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ and I'm dedicated to my church. When was the last time you had a conversation with someone like that? You know, part of our problem is we don't talk to non-Adventists ever. We only know ourselves. And that's part of the challenge, too, is a, as we have opportunity in the community, among our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers. Acts 2 presents a wonderful model for knowing how God would have all his disciples participate in the Great Commission. Now, I'm going to go through this. Uh, kind of fast. Some of this you've heard before. I want to get to the main idea here. Each of these things is worthy of analysis and worthy of development, but I'm going to go through it uh, a little fast for the sake of time. Again, just to remind ourselves, when the day of Pentecost had come, by the way, what day of the week was this Pentecost? You know, it's 50 days. Pentecost means 50 days from Passover. Jesus died on the cross Friday night just before the Passover, which was a Sabbath. So 50 days from Sabbath would be what day of the week? 49 days would be another Sabbath. So the 50th would be the day after the Sabbath, more commonly known as, speak up please, <laughs> Sunday. So this is a Sunday, which again, for those who advocate for Sunday sacredness, they'll look at this and say that's significant, but... Uh, of course, we, we don't see it that way. But anyways, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all in one place. They're together. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a rushing wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. There appeared to them tongues of fire. So you have them together. They hear the wind. They see the fire. And then they're filled with the Holy Spirit and begin to speak. Okay, do you see that? They're together. They hear the wind. They feel the fire. They're filled with the Spirit, and they begin to speak. It's not hard, is it? They were all together. They see the wind. They feel the fire. They're filled with the Spirit, and they begin to speak. Are you with me? That's the pattern. It's not complicated. It starts out with them being together. They congregated together. They took the most of every opportunity to be in one another's presence. And this is not the Sabbath morning, 11 o'clock family worship hour. This was on Sunday. And right after this experience, when you read about the end gathering, later on it says they were meeting day by day. I just have a question for you. Are you dedicated to gathering together with your church family as often as possible? Or is it satisfying enough to you? I don't want to get myself in trouble here, George. Don't get me wrong. Guys, I love that you come to the worship service at 11. It's, it's awesome. It's a beautiful moment that we have together as a church family. It, it's a privilege for me to stand before you. And I, and I feel the weight of responsibility every time I do to share with you something that I think is vital to your heart, vital to your walk with God. It is a glorious sacred moment when we have our 11 o'clock worship service. But we do more than that. And you need more than the 11 o'clock worship service 
Recently, I've told Coach I'd like to help with the baseball team. I love baseball. Love baseball. And so I, I've been trying to help out a little bit. And, and, you know, the way the sports season works, there's not a lot of time between sports, Coach. And some of the kids we have playing for us, it's pretty evident they've not played a lot of um, organized baseball. They're very new at it. And we've talked before, we wish we had a few more practices. How do you take someone who's never really played organized ball and in a practice or two, tell them all they need to know about batting, all they need to know about base running, all they need to know about fielding, all they need to know about stop, uh, uh, note how to read signs, how to slide, how to bunt. How do you do that with only a couple practices? You know, the same analogy is true with our walk with Jesus Christ. We need as much practice as we can because this here is not the game, guys. This is the practice. This is where we come together to encourage and grow one another. When we go outside the doors of this building, that's the game. That's the work. That's the mission. And if you only come to one practice a week, and then you think you're going to go into the game and hit the home run when you go into the batter's box, it doesn't quite work that way. Am, am I being clear? You, am I hurting anyone's feelings, guys? I'm not, I really don't want to. We have a lot of things, you know, we don't do things perfectly here. We, we could do more ministries, better ministries, different ministries. I get it. But we do stories and songs. We do jam and bread. We have Friday night vespers from time to time, or we have evening communion services. It doesn't mean you have to come to all of them, but if you're making it your determined position to say, I will only do the least that I think is necessary, which is the 11 o'clock worship hour, you're missing out on vital opportunities to have God and his community grow you in your faith. And even more, Hebrews says in Hebrews 10, 25, even more as the day draws near, do not forsake your assembling together how we much need one another. That's a sermon all in of itself, Octavia. I, I can't do it all right here, okay? I want you to notice the next thing. They heard the wind. Now, that word wind here is kind of like the wind of breath, like when you say you got the wind knocked out of you, okay? That's the way that Luke uses the word here, wind. They heard the wind. Now, that's obviously a reference to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who is the life. He is the wind. Uh, John In John chapter 3, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, he says, the wind blows where it wants and you don't know where it comes from. So it is with those who are born of the spirit. In John chapter 20, it says that Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So this is a reference to noticing the movement and hearing and feeling and experiencing that in the midst of their group, they saw that the Holy Spirit was moving among them. Now, again, I just have a question for you. How many of you think it's possible that you go one day, one day in your Christian life and the Holy Spirit isn't with you, moving in your midst and trying to direct you to what His plan is for you in His life in that day? Do you think God abandons you for one moment in your life? The Holy Spirit is with us every single day, moving in our midst, doing things. We may not be able to see it, but we can feel the wind. We can hear the wind. And when you're listening, when you're looking, you will see that God is directing you to the things he wants to accomplish in your life every single day. You do not walk a single day on this planet without the Holy Spirit wanting you to be in the middle of His plan and to do something to bless another soul. The wind moves and it rushes and we should feel it. We should look for it. We should pray that God would reveal to us the movement of the wind. And then they felt the fire. And I use this in the kids' quiz. There's a burning reality, a drive that God puts in our lives as we see His hand moving, as the Spirit is in our midst, as we gather for worship, a burning comes into our lives. Um, the Mormons call it the burning of the bosom. But in Luke 24, not to endorse the Mormons, I just that's one community that uses this analogy. In Luke 24, when Jesus is walking with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, but they don't know it's Jesus, you remember this story? And he's telling them the great things about who the Messiah was and everything that the Old Testament said about Jesus. And they're amazed by what they're hearing. 
And then Jesus uh, is with them and he breaks bread, but then he disappears from them. Do you remember this story, Luke chapter 24? They say, were not our hearts burning within us as he talked with us along the way? As you allow God's Spirit to move in your presence and you look for the moving of the Spirit, a burning reality, a passion grows in your heart. A holy passion, by the way. Why, which is why this model is important. Everyone gets passionate every now and then about something. You can get passionate about football. You can get passionate about the floor. You can get passionate about all kinds of things. But as you are praying, as you're gathering, as you're watching for the things of God, a burning passion, a drive and a desire for the salvation of others and the proclamation of the goodness of God grows in your life. Has God done anything good for you? Why are you telling people about it? And I'm not here. I could do better. My, my family doesn't follow, not my, not my wife family, my extended family uh, are not Adventists, and I've done everything I can to be winsome and, and advocating for, for why I believe this is what God's plan is and how everyone is invited into this movement. I love them to death. By the way, they've become Nazarene. Did you know that? <laughs> oh, it's so funny how the wheel turns. We can all do better. But do you feel the fire? Do you feel the Holy Spirit driving you to understand and to be involved? So we talk about that a lot in the church, about uh, you know how the day of Pentecost work and all these things that happen. Notice that what happens next. They're filled with the Spirit, even though they'd had the Spirit previously, by the way. Remember, back in John 20, Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Spirit. Now notice this too. How often do we need to ask for the Holy Spirit? I gave my life to Jesus when I was nine years old. I asked for Him to forgive my sins and come into my life. I was redeemed at the age of, I'm being serious right now, I was redeemed at the age of nine. And I've never had to ask him to do it again since. Does that make sense? We walk day by day in our faith. Even if we've had a powerful experience with Jesus yesterday or last week, every day is a new opportunity to ask for his spirit. Amen? So they receive the spirit, and then here is the whole point of it. What is the point? What is the point, friends, of gathering together seeing the wind, feeling the fire, and being filled with the Spirit if then we say nothing. What is the point? I had a great personal experience with God, and it was all for me. Does that sound right to you? All the things that we do are to be training and directing us to the moment when we can lift up our voice, led by the Spirit of God, with our own self put aside, directed by the Spirit to speak of the great things of God in our life. Now, not everyone is going to respond like when my friend Rusty and I talked or like they did on the day of Pentecost. One more quick story. I was... Uh, going to the country of Greece when I was in college. Um, I had the opportunity to do a summer program um, and to do my second year of Greek uh, in the country of Greece with um, Adventist colleges abroad. And so Bailey's one years old, and my wife, she comes with me. Uh, so we were very thankful that we could travel together. And we're traveling through London. Um, oh, Neil's not here, is he? Uh, sorry, Neil. I'm going to speak ill of your countrymen here in a moment. <laughs> Uh, we're traveling through London, and we're at the airport. I've never traveled internationally before until that moment, so it was all very amazing to me. And we're sitting in the airport waiting for our connection or whatever, and we're on one of these round, like they go uh, a bench that goes around a pillar. So it's this round pillar, and I'm sitting there, and this gentleman sits next to me, very nice, very nice, very English, very nice. Oh, I see you have a family. I'm not, I'm not going to fake a British accent. Forgive me. <laughs> that would be awful. Um, 
But he says in this very thick British English accent, oh, I, I see you're traveling, you have a family, very interesting, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm going to Greece and I'm studying, I'm a student. Oh, you're a student, how wonderful. It's great to be a student. What are you doing? Oh, I'm studying the, the Greek, ancient Greek language. And oh, that's wonderful. Where are you from? And oh, I'm from uh, Washington State, you know, which is way over in the west side of, of the United States. Oh, I've heard of, well, I think I've heard of Seattle, you know, da, 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 da. Very pleasant conversation. And then he says, so what are you studying to be when you go to Greece? I said, well, I'm actually a theology student. I'm studying to become a pastor. I have never seen someone turn so cold so fast. He went like this. He was sitting to my left, so it was his right, and he kind of he heard me say that. He says, I'm studying to become a pastor. I'm a Christian, and I'm, I'm studying to learn the Bible better so I can be a better pastor. And he goes like this. He goes, And he just went totally cold. Just cold shoulder. It happened so quick. It happened so shockingly. It caught me. It's like, it's like surreal. You don't even know what's happening. And it just shocked me. And friends, I share that to you because that will happen. Don't expect every time. And I'm not claiming that that was the Holy Spirit moving through me in that moment. I mean, I like to think it was the Lord working. I wasn't uh, trying to avoid the Spirit by any means. Not every time that you share your faith will everyone say, hey, that's great, tell me more. I want to be baptized too. The words which I command you shall be on your heart. You shall teach them to your sons. You shall talk of them. And I want to make something very clear. I'm almost done here, really, honestly. I'm almost done. I'm not talking about preaching to people. I'm not talking about giving long debates over articles of faith. I'm talking about simply including your faith in your everyday language. I'm a believer in Jesus. I'm not worried about the election. How can you say you're not worried? It's so crazy right now. I'm not worried because I'm a believer in Jesus. Did you know in the 1990s, right around 1997 or so, we, we flipped as a nation. People who are non-Christians are more spiritual in the United States now than Christians are. Did you know that? People are not offended by statements of spirituality as much as you might fear that they are. Oh, if I tell them I'm a Christian, they're going to say, oh, well, then you're a, a whack job. A lot of people are like, oh, I believe in the metaphysical as well. And oh, I do yoga and it's all this wonderful transcendent stuff. A lot of people believe in a spiritual existence. Don't be ashamed. Talk of them when you sit in your house as you walk by the way. Include the language of faith in your life. Do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. Sanctify Christ in your hearts. Be ready to make a defense of those who ask you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Speak up, please. Speak up. They overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. Yes, their life. Yes, their actions. Yes, their moral influence. Yes, their conduct. The, all those things true, but it's by the word of their testimony. There is a God who has changed my life, and I love him. And I'm not afraid to talk about him. Speak up, please. Follow the example of Acts 2, 1 through 4. Gather with the believers. List, look for the wind. Feel the fire. Let the Spirit, ask for the Spirit, and then speak up. Meditate on the mighty deeds of God. What is it that God has done that is worthy of you to talk about? Learn to talk of your faith in everyday life. Every single day is an opportunity God brings before us. Your testimony in word and action is the fulfillment of the Great Commission. And you're never alone. God is with you. The more we practice, the better we get at it. Are you ready to speak up? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it sounds so easy and we could spend much more time looking at all the uh, ins and outs and nuances of it, but Father, we know that time is growing short and each of us has regular opportunities to speak about our great God that we serve and the things that you've done in our life. Help us, Father, to follow the example that we see in the Bible, to be great 
dedicated people, to be trained in the fellowship and assemblies that we have together, to be having our eyes open, to feel the burden and the passion and the fire, to be open to the moving of your Spirit in our lives, and to be willing to share about who you are. It's easy to say it in church. It's easy to say it among like believers. But Lord, help us to know when we can say it to others as well. You don't need to fear if you knew the Lord like I do. You can have a hope too. God is still in the business of changing lives. Help us, Father, to speak up. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being part of our service today and joining us. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sabbath.